It's a high-tech conversation. On the low-tech topic. Live on the World Wide Web via Zoom. Bench Talk 101. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Bench Talk 101. Um, this week, uh, we've got uh, Bill Pavlek joining us. Um, so you probably read the, stri- the description in the email that I sent out. But I thought I'd give uh, Bill a bit more of an introduction tonight. So a master cabinet maker at Colonial, Colonial Williamsburg, I can't talk tonight, and um, he's worked in the Anthony Hay shop since 2005. In his work, he aims to gain insight into 18th century furniture and material culture by recreating or designing pieces with period appropriate tools and techniques. His work can be found in the collections of Colonial Williamsburg, Monticello and private homes. He also writes frequently about woodworking, um, including a monthly blog for finewoodworking.com and articles and reviews for publications like Fine Woodworking Magazine and Mortis and Tenon Magazine. Now, Bill and I have something in common, and I don't think he knows this. Um, we're both musicians. He knows he's a musician. He didn't know I was. Um, a native, port, uh, native of Port Washington, New York, um, Mr. Pavlak earned a BA in music theory and double bass performance from Connecticut College and a Master of Music in, sorry, a Master of Music in Music Theory from the University of North Texas College of Music. That's a mouthful. In addition to building, carving and studying furniture, Bill enjoys playing bass, collecting sound recordings, especially vinyl records, and creating all kinds of things with his son. So I'm gonna hand over to Bill, who's gonna to speak tonight and uh, let him do his thing. Thank you, Bill. Oh, thank you all for having me. Glad to, to be here. Um, and I've got a, a PowerPoint. I'll share that. I thought it would be interesting maybe to talk about some of the sort of unusual things that um, come up in our work. Can you all see the my, my PowerPoint here? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, so I said weirder than I thought as a title and then sort of regretted we're having that as a title with my name right after it, but maybe I'm weirder than I thought too. But coming from this, this sense that uh, just about every period piece I've, I've studied had some surprise in it. Uh, I don't think I've ever looked at something and come away with thinking, well, that was perfectly normal. Um, and I think as a modern person, a 21st century person, we have certain ideas of what constitutes normal for furniture making and tool use and so forth. But uh, in the 18th century, we didn't have George Ellis and, you know, Joyce and Hayward and all these people to read. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of people learning from some older guy telling them what to do. And then maybe it was a little different in the next town and so forth. So always these words here have always, uh, kind of in the front of my mind, there is no 18th century way to make furniture. There are many 18th century ways to make furniture. And so in other words, I'm always prepared to be surprised. And, and sometimes that, um, yeah, sometimes I'll start, like, like all of us, we, we start overthinking things and come up with overly clever um, explanations. And then it turns out, oh, there's a simpler answer. And sometimes we just don't, we can't figure out why things are done a certain way. So a few examples of um, case construction that I thought I'd talk about. This piece lives in the cabinet shop at Colonial Williamsburg. It was made uh, about 25 years ago by my former boss, Matt Kedley. It's gorgeous uh, curly walnut that's that's close to quarter to riffs on. So you get all this wonderful fleck in the grain. Um, but I wanted to talk about something unusual that I noticed on the original piece. I kind of lived with this piece every day for a number of years um, before I ever actually saw the original. Um, and so here's the original. It's actually a mahogany instead of walnut. Pretty typical in that it's a big dovetailed box with a big dovetailed box on top of it. Um, and then the cornice is actually, it's replaced, but the original cornice was you know, a separate thing too. So there's a dovetailed frame that sits on top of the upper case with the molding attached to it. Great way to deal with wood movement. Also a great way for your cornice to go missing 240 years later. Um, but not having the cornice on there allowed us to, to look at this. And if you see where I've got these arrows, you know, we talk all the time about people overcutting their baseline on half blind dovetails on the inside. Um, this is the only time I've seen it 
on the outside. You know, so you all can see those saw cuts there. Um, don't know if this is an, an oops, oh, okay, I'm gonna start sawing this uh, and, and then realized, oh no, I, I need to cut half blind joints. I don't think it's that way because the saw cuts don't all run the same length, you know, the full depth down. These are shorter than these and so forth. If, if speed was what he was concerned about when he was making this, then why bother going with a half blind you know, route at all? Um, maybe having that smoother surface there is better for a, a glue joint, but there's nothing that gets glued to it. So this is the kind of stuff that often excites us when we're studying this furniture. These, these little things, it's like, okay, I see what you did there, but I have absolutely no idea why you, uh, why you did that. Um, so I made a, a desk and bookcase um, a number of years ago now that uh, you can see it here. Again, the, the lower case, pretty typical dovetailed box. The upper case, the top is dovetailed to the sides, but then the, the bottom is, um, let's see here. Uh, if we look at this with the door open, the bottom shelf is the structural bottom. And so the sides extend down below that to make room for these candle slats. And I would think for something like this, I was just looking at this the way I would build it, and I think most people would build it, is maybe a sliding dovetail across there. Um, but in, instead, let's see, there's the original. And if you look on the side, you can see these two giant dovetails. Um, this is the bottom here. So they got these two giant dovetails and you slide the whole bottom up. Um, and you know, the, the candle slides, are, these are, are later replacements uh, to guide the, the candle slides. But, you're, you know, if your glue gives out, gravity's not gonna hold that up. Um, so not something I've seen on any other piece. This, the original of this was made by a cabinet maker named Peter Scott, who started working in Williamsburg by 1721. He was British trained, not exactly sure where. Um, died in 1775. So he's an active as a cabinet maker for over 50 years in Williamsburg. And we've got a couple of other bookcases of his that are done uh, exactly the same way. Really unusual thing. So this is something about Peter Scott and his decision making. Um, and I don't know if anybody's ever seen anything like this um, in England or in Scotland. I, I, Adam Bowett was in the shop one time while I was working on this and I asked him about it and he wasn't, he wasn't familiar with this. So I figure if Peter Scott's doing this, he learned it from somebody, um, but you know, maybe, maybe he came up with this himself. But again, it's a, weirder than I thought, you know, it, it is an unusual thing. Uh, and here's, you can, for scale, you can kind of get a sense of these on, on mine. Uh, they were kind of fun to cut. Um, it's basically just like cutting two very short little sliding dovetails. So um, drilled out a little bit of a, a, a relief back here, give my saw some room to move, made my angled cuts, chiseled out the waste pretty quickly, and then cleaned things that used a router plane and a um, you know large paring chisel. That router plane is one that Mac Headley made uh, decades ago. Uh, that we've always used. It's it, it, we love it, but it's probably too much like a, a, a wooden version of a Stanley router plane in its design. But um, it's kind of it's a it's a nice tool. Um, so nails. I mean, that's one thing in talking to the public. Um, people always ask, you know, if nails were expensive, where nails came from, or they'll come in with with assumptions that cabinet makers never used nails, and so it's it's always nice to you know, convince them otherwise. But sometimes, you know, as cabinet makers and woodworkers in general, we learn how to cut dovetails and then we get really snobby about dovetails. It's like, it's not dovetailed together, it can't be right. Um, anyway, this, this escritoire here is something that I made a few years ago. The original is actually signed and dated. It's made in Philadelphia in 1707 by Edward Evans. Um, there's, there's the original. It's been in the Colonial Williamsburg collection for a, a long time. And in studying the original, I was surprised by certain sort of nail use in this, which, which sort of got me thinking in a direction that got me a little bit in trouble. So, um, well, let me go back. So this, the, the molding right here, the, the waste molding on this, okay, is actually nailed to the top. So we're looking at the 
underside right now of the, the lowercase top. And that molding is nailed on with and clinched over. Um, and that's, to me, kind of excesses. I've, I've, this is the first, when I did this, this is the first time I've ever used a two and a half inch long nail in furniture construction. Um, and you can see over here on the other side, he clinched it the wrong direction and split out that pine probably uh, really early on. Um, we look at the bottom of the piece. There's this, these pine blocks added on here to, to beef things up to receive the molding. Those are clinch nailed into the bottom of the case. And so you can see that I don't have a good picture of that on the original, but on the right there, you can see, see that on my works. Um, and then on the left is, is my attaching that, that top molding. Um, so that was sort of unusual. And it put my eye, this idea in my head that this guy, Edward Evans, is probably doing more of a, a joiner than a, a cabinet maker. We know very little about him, but his name shows up in, in places that implies he might have been doing some ship, uh, like joiners work on ships as well in Philadelphia. Um, so it gets this idea that this guy likes big nails in my head. And when it comes time to study the upper case. Here it is on the original. And the, the structural top is this board right here. Um, so you can see on the left in this, the top is just, a, it's a pine board that's just nailed on from above. It's basically like a, a dust board or a, a hat in a way. On the right is the, <laughs> look at the back bottom is attached with a massive sliding dovetail. Um, and it's great when things like this show through the backboard. So it takes away some of the guesswork. And that also oddly goes all the way through in the front. This is on my reproduction. Um, kind of another unusual thing. They have this gap. So on the left, um, got this gap that's created. The, he squared it up. And then, you know, so at the front end here, cut away the, the slope of the dovetail. that should be like that squared it up and then dropped in a little fill piece to take care of that. So you've got a sliding dovetail below. And I figured that this board up here was probably the same uh, until I looked at it. And then you realize, well, no, there's too much hanging out front. That would be sort of a, a pain to cut. And then I saw this little, see that arrow, that little um, opening right there. There's a shallow dado that runs the whole length of this, just a 16th of an inch deep. So I immediately thought, okay, that makes sense. He's got a shallow dado and then maybe a series of through tenons to hold all of this together. And by the way, there's another clinch nail holding this, this uh, freeze molding in place right there. So again, in my head, it's like, this guy loves nails. Uh, looking from the outside of the piece, this is right here. This molding is covering up that where that, um, where that structural top is. Couldn't see any through tenons on the outside. Usually you can see those things on the inside with the flashlight and uh, you know, getting even your phone camera in there. You can usually find those evidence of, of tenons. Didn't see any. Uh, and so kind of got this idea in my head. Well, just that shallow dado, maybe he makes a shallow dado and reg that registers the piece in place. And then he drives some big nails and to hold it in place. So that's what I assumed the structure was based on his use of those nails. So this weirder than I thought, but now I'm starting to think weirdly. Uh, and so that's exactly what I did. Our blacksmiths made these nice T-head nails for me, drove those in, I distinctly remember on a Sunday afternoon. And on Tuesday, I was over at the museum looking at something else on the piece. And I decided to take a look at the side because I, you know, I slipped with my hammer and, and made a little dent. I was like, oh, later today I have to steam that dent out. No big deal. I wonder if, I wonder if there's any evidence of him slipping with a hammer. I might as well look. And just looking at this piece from a different angle, lo and behold, right under this molding, I could see little tenons poking through. And every other angle that I looked this, at this from, um, I couldn't see those. They were obscured by shadow or just by the crud that accumulates under a molding and finish over time. So, you know, it actually ended up being more normal than I thought, but I was not gonna try taking those, those monster nails out of, out of all that walnut. So uh, I think the piece will be okay um, being held together that way. But you know, again, this was kind of in, a neat thing, a slightly unusual thing, though, 
Um, and then this is a, a cradle that I made a few years ago. I don't have a great picture to show this, but it's a, a nice high style mahogany cradle made in 1757 for a um, well-to-do New York man who um, in his um, later years uh, became ill and had, there's a senility cradle that was made for him, a six foot long cradle, uh, which is, those are always wild to see. But anyway, this, this cradle, the thing that's unusual about it is, uh, so high style thing, is the way the bottom is held in place. So you've got this trapezoid, uh, you know, construction. It's a crummy drawing I, I made up real quick last night. Um, so you've got the sides, the bottom board is not, properly attached to anything. It doesn't sit in a groove in this dovetailed box. The bottom board's edges are beveled. It drops down into the, the cradle. It can't, because of that angle, it can't fall out the bottom, but it can fall out from the top. So he just made the rocker in a way like this. So you screw the bottom board onto the rockers and the bottom is now held in place unless it shrinks up radically at some point. And that that's one of those things where I remember looking at this uh, just as a project before I even studied the original, thinking, well, how, do you, how am I going to cut a groove at an angle for the bottom? Or maybe you just use a rabbit. Uh, but then that, how does that even get held in? So I was figuring I had to cut some sort of angled groove. And uh, this guy just, no, very, very simple, clever solution. It seemed at the time like, well, this can't be right. I, you know, to make a structure where you just drop a board in and, and that's it. But 1757 to 2009 when I worked on this and it, it that has not been replaced it seems like it's been fine so uh, that that seems to have worked out there's lots of unusual things always uh, about drawers um, a couple of, of favorites that I thought would be fun to, to share are you know today for good reason in some ways uh, sometimes it's exaggerated we love these piston fit drawers I need to point that out. Um, that, was, that was a lot of drawers. Some of the easiest drawers I've ever had to make and fit though, because the drawers are not square. This is here, you can see on the left, this is the freeze molding, which is like often on these pieces is, is drawer itself. You can see how out of square this is on the one side. It's actually square on the other side. Um, here's one of the secret compartments. It's out of square, front to back. Um, Here's one of the ones I made. It is out of square, front to back. Every single drawer back was 3 16 of an inch shorter than the drawer front. I know, uh, so 3 16 less long. So they're making this trapezoid shaped box, um, which made fitting the drawers a lot easier. Uh, and for all the smaller drawers, it works well. The, the lower drawer on, on the bottom case is so big that that much play in there is, is, is quite a bit. Um, some of them, you can see on the side of this drawer, looking at it from the side in the original, without a square, I think you can see that the, the side is also tapered as is the bottom's thickness. The bottom comes all the way, it's just, you know, rabbited in the front and then just runs all the way to the edges of the sides and backs nailed on. It's typical in early construction. Um, not all the drawers have that much taper in that direction, but, you know, sometimes we'll see something weird on a piece and you think, um, Okay, well, something went wrong. This one board got cut a little short. I get that. I've done that. Everybody has, but you know, you decided to stick with it. Uh, but I decided, fortunately, <laughs> I, sometimes I'm not that disciplined, but I decided, you know what? I should check another drawer. And sure enough, that drawer was 3 16th inch shorter. And again, 20 drawers, everyone, no matter how big or small, all the back's shorter by that same amount. This is looking at the back of my reproduction. You can see these secret compartments back here. Just show this view. You can kind of see that little gap, you know, in every side. Um, and and my thinking is this is probably how he's dealing with just making the drawers fit, but not not allowing them to get stuck. Less likely to get stuck as as things move. Um, I know some people will make their backs shorter by like the thickness of a card scraper. So this is a, a bit more extreme than that. And again, I don't know that if I was designing a piece, I would do it this way, but it it made again made fitting the drawers take so much less time than it than it normally does and then currently got a on again off again project a couple of us are working on it's a 
a high chest of drawers. It was made out in the Shenandoah Valley in the 1790s. There are a lot of strange things about this piece um, made in cherry. One of the strangest things about it is the rear feet face forward. There are a handful of 18th century pieces that do that, but we always like to tell visitors that that's, that's how things work when you go to the zoo, but usually in the museum, those, those back legs are gonna, gonna face backwards. Um, it doesn't look bad at the feet, but it looks awkward where the, where the knee and the skirt sort of come together up there. This is a piece filled with knots. That's one of the things that I keep a, I always take pictures when I see knots um, in interesting places and old pieces. We have this obsessive idea and have for a long time with good reason of trying to avoid knots. Even on pretty fine 18th century pieces, sometimes they'll be in prominent and surprising places. It speaks to sometimes the frugality. Here on the right, there's that knot that runs right through the, the quarter column on the lower case. So they're choosing a knot. He's just doing that to himself. You know, why, do, why are you doing that? Probably this is the best piece of wood you had for this job, but now you've got to carve this quarter column through that knot. Then on the left, you can just see it. I couldn't find a better picture. Um, there's a knot also at the thinnest point, um, pretty much, on this, this cabriole leg. And that, that goes all the way through the leg. Clearly didn't work. This, this is broken a few times and has been more recently stabilized again. But there's a lot of, lot of furniture on top of that. So those, some strange things. But then, you know, a typical thing, of course, in a, in a case piece is to have drawer stops like these glued in up front that'll engage with the backside of, of the drawer front to keep everything flush and, and, and even and looking pretty. Um, in those cases, the drawer bottom is usually raised up a little bit, so it clears that. But I, this is the only time I've seen this. In this piece, the drawer bottoms, you can see just with a, with a jack plane, aggressively created these, these troughs um, on, on either side of that drawer bottom. Just going across the grain, doesn't care at all about being, you know, neat and tidy, anything like that. And then, you know, you can see here how that how that works. So his drawer bottom clears the stops, and those engage the the front of the drawer. Um, the drawers in this they, they all work well, um, but that again, that's that's a first time I've seen that. It seems like a, a lot of work. Why not make the bottom just a little bit thinner? Or, you know, put it in a slightly different way. Um, but every, every one of the drawers, I think there are 15 drawers in this piece, they're all, all done uh, with that technique. There's a, another high chest that survives that was made by the same shop. I haven't had a chance to, to look at it personally. And I'm curious just to, to see if they, they use this again or not. Um, a couple of last little strange, hard to explain things. Talking about this Peter Scott desk earlier um, that I made and with those big dovetails. We've got several Peter Scott pieces in our collection, and he changes his techniques a little bit over 50 years. Uh, of course, there's probably other stuff that survives by him that doesn't look like these things, and it's, it's hard to know they're by him, you know, because he didn't sign his work. So we're kind of banking on consistency to attribute things to him, or curators are. But he uses an odd mixture of woods in a way. Um, when we first approached that desk, it was the first Peter Scott desk that I had looked at. And you got your primary wood on the front of the drawer. And then he used oak for the sides and the back. And this is from a different reproduction of a Scott piece. So you can see the white oak here and then the, also the white oak bottom. But he used southern yellow pine for the drawer back. And that's another one of those things where looking at one piece, we thought, okay, I get that. He just had some pine boards that were you know, the right size and, and just to make things easier and faster, make the drawer back out of pine. And that, that sort of sounded convincing to all of us in the shop until we looked at the next piece and the next piece and the next piece by Scott. And he uses that technique on just about all of his pieces. Um, oak sides, oak bottom, pine back. He uses pine as the secondary wood for everything else. So the, the drawer dividers, case backs, things like that. Um, and so it's clearly a deliberate method of his. And one of the later desks attributed to him, he switched to pine drawer sides because we've got really nice, durable, hard, um, long leaf southern yellow pine uh, that's available to folks in, in this part of Virginia. So it, it wears as well as oak. And 
you get quarter saw and stuff, it can be incredibly stable. Uh, so it's perfect drawer side material. Um, but we wonder, is, is Oak just a, a remnant of his, his British training? Or, you know, Oak is, I want to use that for my drawer sides. I don't know. It's, we, we don't have good prices to tell us, you know, pine was a little bit cheaper. But this one later piece, he, I don't think I put a picture, yeah, I didn't put a picture in here. This one later piece, he uses um, pine for the, the big drawers for all of the parts, but then still the upper drawers in, in the desk gallery, those little drawers, he used oak for everything on those, which I wonder if he just has this hierarchical attitude about pine and oak and, and the pine was cheap enough. But that's, again, one of these things that I don't know that we'll ever have an answer, but it's it's fun to try to come up with explanations. Sometimes in, in reproducing pieces like this, it's uh, it's fun to get to think about it. But at the end, you know, if it's a reasonable thing, like using these two different woods, um, when somebody asks why you did it, you can just say, well, that's because that's how he did it. You know, it's not always the the most satisfying answer, but sometimes that's the answer that we'll <laughs> get to hide behind. And then, uh, you know, I um, had so many other things I thought I, I could talk about this or talk about that, but I thought I didn't want to bore everybody with every little detail, but I, I thought I would I'd mention something about saws. Um, for a long time in the hay shop, we've, we've only used rip saws. All of our saw, saws are filed rip. And this is, these are my two panel saws. Each of us has Colonial Williamsburg owns all our tools, but we each have our own kit that we're responsible for. These are my two panel saws. They were both made in house um, and about 20 or so years ago, or a little over 20 years ago at this point, based on Kenyan saws in the in the seat and chest. The, the bigger one down below is five and a half teeth. Uh, the, the top one is, is a bit fine with 10, 10 teeth per inch. Um, I think just about everybody else has, has an eight tooth branch as their, as their finer saw. Um, years ago, Jay Gaynor, um, you know, in, in researching all of this, you know, thought, well, I've he hasn't seen reference to cross-cutting saws besides the big ones for cross-cutting a log in the 18th century. See evidence of those coming later. Doesn't mean that people didn't have cross-cut saws, but I think he convinced the guys in the hay shop, this is probably in the 90s, I guess, to experiment. So what happens if you file all of your saws rip? Um, how does that work out? And it works well. Um, it's, it's not perfect. There are plenty of times where I wish I had a crosscut saw, but it, it works well enough. What we'll do generally is we might lay back the, the, you know, lay the tooth back a little bit for a saw that I'm going to crosscut more with, or I'll just use a, a saw with, with finer teeth to do more crosscutting. Um, Let's see here, it's, a, it's just a detail of those. I mean, that, that biggest rip saw, I will use it for breaking down boards occasionally, cross-cutting where coarseness isn't a, an issue. But this other one, the teeth are, are, are fine enough and the angle of attack can be such that I can get a pretty clean cross-cut with it. Um, but somehow over the, over the years, um, we think interpreting at Colonial Williamsburg can be like a game of telephone. Um, you hear one person say something, you haven't seen the evidence of whatever it is, but and so well, that sounds pretty good. And I'll, I'll repeat that, but inadvertently you change it a little bit. Uh, it, it's, it's easy for sometimes for things that are maybes and probably or possibly to become, well, this is how they did it. So I've read in a number of places out there in the world that at Colonial Williamsburg, they, they believe that they only had crosscut saw or only had rip saws in the 18th century. And I don't think we believe that. <laughs> I think this is just sort of, it was a theory that Jay Gaynor had and then something we decided, okay, let's experiment with. And we, we found that it works well. In most cases, this is my, my, probably my favorite saw in the shop. This is a tenon saw, it's 19 inch long blade based on an original in our collection. Um, and using that, for cutting a tenon, it's great. Cutting the shoulder, that's the one time that I generally wish I had a cross cut saw, but I, we're not cutting Ten in shoulders and expecting them to be perfect right off the right off the saw. So um, that's another one of those things, though, that I thought I would throw in with this this weirder than I thought idea. Because when I first started in the hay shop in, in 2005, I had been woodworking as a hobby for a handful of years. 
I had sharpened a couple of saws, but was still scared to death of, of saw sharpening. Um, and for whatever reason, when, when I started, I was convinced that on my first day, they were going to tell me to, to sharpen a crosscut saw and I wasn't going to know how to do it. And I was going to be fired. The sane voice in my head said, well, you're an apprentice. They're, they're, they're there to teach you. But it was, it was quite a relief when they said, oh, no, no, we just, we just file everything, everything rip. And I, I found again, that that's, that's worked pretty well uh, over the years. I think that is, that's my, it's the end of my, my slides. Just thought I'd run through a, you know, again, a, a variety of odds and ends, little, little things that I was hoping may be just a little bit different from some things some of you have seen before. Okay, well, thank you very much, Bill. Thanks for a brilliant talk. I'm bursting with questions already. Um, but I'm going to let people people ask questions first uh, before okay. I get to myself. Um, so there are a few new people who've joined tonight. Those of you who haven't joined before, if you put your name in the chat, I'll ask you to unmute and ask your question. Um, so Andy Tuckwell, you, you got there nice and early. Well, like, like you, I'm, I'm bursting with questions, but I can also offer a, a couple more references. First of all, let me say that's a fascinating talk, really interesting subject. And it's this sort of details that is poorly covered elsewhere. And it's really nice to find somebody interested in it who wants to know, did it happen? Did it happen everywhere? Was it a personal thing? Was it accidental? Was it deliberate? Was it economic or what? Right. Um, because you know, that's the, this is the best way of learning uh, from what, what has been done and what works. So first of all, big thank you from me for, for sharing this with us. But the question of drawers being narrow at the back than they're up front. Mm -hmm. um, I've got, I've not got any 18th century furniture, but we have got two or three bits of late 19th, possibly very early 20th century furniture in daily use. And they're from the time when ordinary people could only buy stuff that was handmade because in the UK, machine making hadn't taken over. It was small workshops doing half a dozen of this, dozen of those, and it wasn't all big steam powered stuff. Um, and there'd been a discussion on an online forum I was active on at the time about how to make drawers fit, and whether they should be wider at the back or, or the front. Um, and I went and measured what we've got and two pieces. The nicest of them is a big triple door wardrobe, which is a combination of drawers at the bottom, hanging space at the top, although it would have originally been shallow trays at the top. Um, um, all enclosed in doors. And in measuring that, the gaps for the drawers inside the carcass are actually an eighth of an inch wider at the back. Um, and that's true throughout the piece. Okay, that's, yeah, that's interesting. Other side of the bedroom, nice um, sweet chestnut chest of drawers. Um, again, about 1890s, 1900. And the same difference, the drawers are square, but the void into which they slide is about an eighth wider at the back. And over a drawer that's say um, two foot deep, it doesn't make it too sloppy, it slides in nicely. And then the other thing that those, all those half dozen drawers have got in common is that they've got on the one piece, mahogany sides um, and pine for the back of the drawer. So these are much bigger drawers. These are sort of you know, chest of drawer size drawers for putting clothes in. And on the other one, uh, oak drawer sides and pine across the back. And I, it looks rational to me because there's much more wear on the sides where they're actually sliding with friction. And I've seen cheaper um, old built-in fitments where the, the pine has been worn away three quarters of an inch uh, through you know, too much wear over the century or so. Um, but you don't need oak across the back, it doesn't get the wear. And there must have been a significant price difference at the time. And just, I mean, some of the pictures who are showing, I could recognize almost with you know, the knots and the, the splits and the, 
the rougher work where mm. it didn't show. Um, um, it's fascinating. Thank you for sharing it. I'll shut up. Yeah, and I, I think most of us, you know, I get to see antiques more often than and more closely than most woodworkers. But obviously, there's plenty of people that, that live with this stuff all the time, or, or you know, conservators who who have the best view uh, mm. of these mm. things. Um, but I wish one of the things that I like about my job um, is getting to sh to share with people all of that stuff that all because all of those the tool marks, all of the the surfaces that aren't as pristine and so forth. Those are all. That's like those are that's the human story, right? It's not just mm -hmm. about making a nice piece of furniture. It's uh, you have uh, economic pressures and and all all of this stuff, and people can relate to it. But you know, most most books, you know, you see the outside, but you don't see all the pictures of of the insides and everything. And and so it's it's fun to you know be able to share that with folks. Um, once in a while, we we see something that's hard to copy. It's like that's just a bit sloppy, you know, mm -hmm. but. You know, so maybe maybe mine will be just a touch neater. But when I first started, there was a, I think Adam Cherubini had written an article or a blog post uh, saying that the hay shop's drawer bottoms are too nice, <laughs> and our our reproduction yeah. pieces. And I thought, well, okay, they probably are. Um, and I, I noticed over the first several months after that article came out, all of my more seasoned uh, colleagues, all since retired, but they, one by one, because they were upset with that at first but one by one uh, over a couple of months they all started you know saying that in their interpretations to the public but our draw bottoms are probably a little too neat we just you know a little little more you know mm. we know that that they're they're rougher but we actually have to force ourselves to do this because we're not often working to a deadline yeah yeah i think economic pressure is a, a great design force yeah thank you i'll let somebody thank do you, it Andy. Go back to spotlighting Bill and add Matthias because he's already um, he's got his name in second instead of first this week. Yes. Uh, so uh, again, please let me join Andy in saying thank you very, very, very much. This was hugely interesting. Um, not that I was expecting anything less, but it certainly was. Uh, a sort of a comment and a question. Uh, what when you mentioned those drawers? that Andy also was talking about being made narrower at the back. Mm -hmm. uh, I recently was uh, checking a few things on drawer making in uh, Robert Waring's The Essential Woodworker. And he recommends that the back of the case should be made about a 32nd of an inch, maybe up to a second, 16th of an inch wider at the back than it is at the front. So essentially getting the same effect, but working on the case rather than on the drawer. Mm -hmm. uh, so the drawer is square, but the case is wider at the back. Th that is what I was saying, Matthias. My, oh, my, right. my case uh, is wider, is that. Yeah. drawers are square. Yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, I believe that he is recommending a technique that is based on what was then the conceived uh, idea about the tr traditional way of making these things. At least he's saying in first class work, it should be done that way. Yeah. If you don't uh, mind me jumping, just... jumping in there, it sort of makes sense that the case is wider than the, rather than the drawers being out of square. Because if someone were to take a drawer out and look at the drawer, it would still be square, but they wouldn't necessarily think to check the case. It, it would look neater uh, yeah. to the customer to, oh yes, yeah. my, my drawers are, are, are square as they should be. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I also don't know. I, I also think that what Andy was saying about oak being, uh, uh, for be, being used for the sides uh, for better wear resistance makes a lot of sense. Although I suppose one could also imagine if, if it's considered a, a nicer wood that the bottom and the sides are the parts the, of the inner parts of the drawer that you're actually going to see when you open it, whereas the back you usually don't see unless you really pull it all the way out. Right, and this so this this long leaf pine um, yeah. is wears as well as as oak does, and yeah. so I don't know if it, if it's like he's come over and he hasn't learned that yet, <laughs> um, but you know it's it's very different than 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 most pines. Like most of the the floors and 
Colonial Williamsburg are made out of, of reclaimed longleaf pine or original stuff. And it just, it's, it's so hard. It's miserable stuff to plane. <laughs> Um, uh, and then, then I wanted to ask you, uh, so you already partially answered the question in saying that you occasionally wish you had a cross cut saw for certain cuts, but uh, give, um, g given that you are doing not only hand tool woodworking, but period hand tool woodworking, which limits, as it were, your selection of hand tools, mm -hmm. uh, is there, are, there, are there more modern hand tools that, other than cross cut saws, that you uh ever and anon find yourself wishing you were allowed to use sure yeah yeah and it's at, at home i'm mostly a hand tool woodworker mm -hmm. i i mostly use more modern hand tools yeah um i <laughs> i prefer wooden planes but when i'm using like a a stanley plane in about two minutes i get comfortable with it you know um i'm not i don't miss i, don't, I can adjust a, a wedge i have no problem doing that i think there's two that I come up with again and again, and maybe maybe I'll mention a third too, um, but a combination square. I just find a combination square incredibly handy. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're necessary, but it's just one of those tools that I've always used and always had close to hand. Uh, and the other is a block plane. Again, you learn ways to, to not mm -hmm. have a nice low angle block plane. Um, don't I learned that I don't need one, but I really appreciate it, yeah. you know, when I'm at home. Um, the other thing, which when we're in the hay shop makes makes complete sense. And it's it's usually when people ask that question, this is this is how I'll answer it. The first time I did it, I was being sarcastic. And then I, I realized, no, I'm actually serious. And that is light. Ah, you know, yes. That is the, the biggest difference um, is I have absolutely no control over the light. Um, and I have beautiful natural light until it's gone or until it's cloudy, you know, or, or this time of year at about 430, you'll have to stop doing, you know, most work and next week it'll be a little better and, and, and so forth. But rainy days are the toughest for us because there's no way to predict. It's like, oh, at 1045, it'll be light enough to dovetail. But at you know eleven o'clock, you gotta you gotta come up with something else, and we experiment with candles, but I I don't know that we've ever experimented enough with them. Um, they're that's the one the one thing that when I use candlelight, which I don't do often, I'll usually find something else to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I do, that's the one thing where I'm generally thinking about what it's not. You know, it's not modern light, uh, you know, that I can just turn on and have a lot of and not catch my hair on fire um, yeah. as I'm leaning over work. But with with all the other tools, I'm used to them enough that, you know, I rarely, you know, I, I rarely even doing a long rip wishing, oh, I wish I could take this to the bandsaw or something. And I think in part that's because I generally don't have those economic pressures, yeah. you know. Um, but yeah, I think the, the light is, is a big one. And it's something that, I, I really like to think about not just in terms of the work environment and what the work day would have been like and this very keen sense of the seasons, mm -hmm. um, you know, beyond just being an inconvenience because it's darker earlier in the winter, but um, you have to- And much really, longer hours in the summer. Yeah, yeah, so you're, that impacts just the culture at large so much, but also just as a furniture maker, I love, I mean, it's great to see pictures in a book of things with good, even lighting and seamless backgrounds. But I love seeing things that I'm making in natural light uh, with strong shadows at the end of the day, carvings, you know, really come out or moldings. It's, oh, okay, that's why they made that molding. And, you know, Cause the, of just the, that play of shadow and light. Um, I think that's, uh, I don't know, that's that's one of those things that uh, you don't get like mystical about this, but that end of the day light, especially just makes me feel like, okay, this is what it looks like in the 18th century. You know, it gives that, that yes, strong yes, sense yes, of yes. connection. Um, and and, and I, I agree, I, I would not have thought of it, but of course, yeah, it makes perfect sense. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Matthias. Um, over to Richard Arnold. Hello, Bill. Thank you, that was a really, really interesting talk. I've uh, been looking forward to this one. Um, one question I wanted to ask, um, was when you're working at Williamsburg in the shop, um, the timber you're using, do you use air dried stock all the time? Not all the time. When we can, we do. Um, we, 
I mean, the two woods we use most are walnut and mahogany. And all of our walnut is local and we can, we can air dry it ourselves um, or buy it from somebody who has. Um, 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago, we had a big hurricane that hit, hit Williamsburg hard and no buildings were really damaged, but we lost a handful of good sized walnut trees. We paid somebody with a bandsaw mill to come in and saw those up. We air dried them. And that's, we've been feasting on that for the last several years and will be for some time to come. That's the one advantage of being really slow and, and spending half of our day talking to people. But you know, we've got some beautiful 24 inch wide boards out of that and so forth. And it's extra, extra special because it's local. But with mahogany, we can really only get stuff that's kiln dried. Um, and that's to, to us, it's, it's never been a, a deal breaker. Um, but, uh, you know, we, generally with anything exotic, we rarely use other exotics. But sometimes it'll come up with the harpsichord making that, that goes on in the shop as well. Um, usually we'll just buy whatever we can. 25 years ago, or I guess the late 80s, so 30 years ago, um, Mac uh, was able to, I don't know how, how this happened. They were able to convince somebody in, in South America to send us mahogany logs. Um, and the way things work with customs everywhere, those logs ended up sitting in port for a couple of years. And, and so they were in pretty bad shape when we finally got them. Um, once we got them, we had them sawn up and seasoned them. We still have some of that material because it's, it's, it wasn't the nicest mahogany. It was really soft and everything, uh, but it was also pale in color. It was also the, the, the logs had gotten so much damaged by just sitting as a log um, for, for a couple of years. And, and so they made, they made an attempt, but I think it was a, a bad experience all around because we're just doing things differently than people normally do them. And everybody had to spend months trying to figure out if they were allowed to send us this, <laughs> this stuff. So the reason, one of the reasons I asked is that I tend to find myself that I find hand tool woodworking, particularly with old wooden planes and what have you, a lot easier with air dried stock rather than killed. And I don't think a lot of people appreciate what an advantage that probably was for them. Um, it certainly seems to work a lot sweeter with a lot less tear out. And it's just a, a pleasanter experience in my opinion, but. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree. And I, I don't, I don't know of anybody that's ever worked in the shop that would say anything different either. Yeah. 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 But I, I think people sometimes maybe struggle with molding planes and things working with kiln dry stock and, you know, they're thinking, you know, this tool's bloody useless or whatever, but they perhaps don't appreciate what it was originally intended to work on. Um, and I think the air drive makes quite a bit of difference. Um, but uh, one last thing, what, what you were talking about that, I picked up the nearest bit of 18th century furniture I got close at hand. This little drawers out of a, an oak bureau. Uh, it's an eighth of an inch narrow okay. at the back with the front. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> And it's way, way out of square. <laughs> so. Yeah, with with that original piece, sometimes it was it was out of square, like it was evenly tapered. Other times it was all to one direction or yeah. the other, never yeah. going, you know, beyond yeah. ninety. But yeah. I, I think one of the things, the, the sort of the lessons from that, the three sixteenths is, is a pretty big difference, and so it was very noticeable. And and so my question coming out of that, when I well, I check pieces now when I study them is are the backs actually shorter than the front? Because if it's if it's just an eighth of an inch, sometimes that's easy enough to overlook or, you know, um, if, if there's a difference in the case side on an old piece, that's often hard to measure um, accurately, uh, especially since you can't really get in the back unless you take the backboards off. But. Yeah. Thank you, anyway. Cheers. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, moving over to Rusty when I can find him. There we go. Hey, Bill. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I have two questions. One, one is facetious, and one might be too big for to answer here. You might need to come back for another presentation. So the first one is, how many of those um, 
weird things do you have that that you talked about today? Do you, do you think uh, had a an apprentice that got uh, badly beaten afterwards? <laughs> Yeah, there's a I've, there's a few uh, that I can think of where you want there's something had to have gone on like that. Yeah. But then, then then maybe somebody should have smacked the master around for keeping that bad work in the in the finished product. Well, maybe if you have to deliver a desk, you know, within right. 48 yeah. hours and you have an yeah. army working. Um, so the other question and, and I, I'm, I'm going to profess ignorance here and maybe I'm the only one who doesn't know the answer here in this group. You mentioned the hay shop a number of times, and I have two questions. One, what is it? Right. And two, uh, you mentioned that you work there, so it's a job. It's not a volunteer right. opportunity. Right. What's it like, and how does one get to that? Like, did you have to sacrifice a kidney to get a job there? or? No, so yeah, and I, I, you know what, I was, I was driving home from work uh, to do this. I thought I should, I should probably explain all of that, and then I, I completely forgot to. Yeah, so you the hay shop is, 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 well, thank, yes, thank you. Uh, the hay shop is the cabinet shop at Colonial Williamsburg. Uh, it is a reconstructed building, but it is reconstructed on the footprint of a cabinet shop that was on this one particular spot in town in the 18th century. Just fascinating archaeology done on the site in 1960. Um, the building spans a little creek, which is very unusual. Uh, no, no water power or anything like that. Anthony Hay was the first master of the shop. We know he was in Williamsburg by the late 1740s. We don't know when he was born or where he came from. Uh, strong speculation that he was trained in Scotland and came from Scotland, but we just don't know. He ran the business. He was a cabinet maker through the 1750s up till late 1766. At that time, he took over the Raleigh Tavern, which was the, probably one of the biggest taverns and establishments in town. Um, and then he ended up dying three years later. The shop was then taken over. Uh, Hay still owned the, the building, but the business was taken over by a man named Benjamin Bucktrout, who we think worked for Hay for a while, but he was a, he had also, he kind of moved around town. He advertises himself as a London trained cabinet maker. When he took over the hay shop, he advertised that he'd make harpsichords and spinets along with doing all the furniture work, which is why we take on harpsichord work today, but that's a separate trade within the shop. Um, we don't have any way to really explain that advertisement. We know he did some repair work on a couple of harpsichords years later. Don't know if he ever made one. And then when Hay died in 1770, the business was sold. Bucktrout moved, I guess their agreement was over. He moved elsewhere in town and it was taken over by a guy named Edmund Dickinson, who we think apprenticed to Hay. He ran the shop until 76. And then he, he went off uh, to war fighting on the American side in, in the revolution and was killed in action in 1778. So that was the end of the shop. By the early 1780s, the building disappeared from the records, probably because it's built in the, in the bottom of essentially a gully. It was really undesirable land. It's, got, it's over a little stream, so not the best place for a standing building. Williamsburg ceased to be the capital of Virginia at the same time in the early 1780s. Capital moved west to Richmond, and Williamsburg stayed a small town, and I think that sort of undesirable lot was just left alone. Um, and so the really great archaeology there. Cabinet making has been part of Colonial Williamsburg, I think, since the 30s. Our modern, the, the hay shop was reconstructed in the mid 60s and our, our sort of modern tradition of really only using hand tools to do the work began in the 70s. Um, prior to that, there were some great cabinet makers building stuff there, but doing a lot of work in the machine shop behind the scenes and then maybe finishing things out by hand. Um, so since, since the mid 70s, um, it's been all hand tools. I, I, yeah, you know, uh, and, and really trying to be sensitive to all of these strange things that I'm, I'm talking about, really paying attention to the antiques, um, rather than just making a generic 18th century, this or that. Um, I got the job, I don't know how I got the job. <laughs> you know, I, I applied online, we just hired a, a new apprentice harpsichord maker. One of the reasons it's, it's hard to get a job at Colonial Williamsburg is that well, like when I started, the most junior man on staff had been there for 22 years. He's now our, our lead harpsichord maker, who's who's uh, you know coming up on on 39 years uh, in a couple of months. Um, everybody else had been there for 30 plus years, and so we had a good group of people, very skilled people, 
Um, it's museum work. It's a not-for-profit organization. You don't get paid a lot, um, but you can professionally, um, you can make a living working with hand tools and, and have health insurance and vacation time and all of those, those, those benefits of, of working for a larger organization. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a unique job. It's a job I really enjoy because it's three jobs. It's being a furniture maker, it's researching, and it's also interpreting to people. I like that I get to talk to woodworkers, but I also like that I get to tell, you know, people that didn't think they cared about furniture, about furniture or, or hand tool woodworking or, or whatever. Um, but yet we, to, to work here, you have to be interested in doing those, all, all three of those those things. But yeah, so that that's the hay shop. It, it's, um, it's the reconstructed cabinet shop at, at Colonial Williamsburg. Thank you very much. Um, and you guys are open right now? We are, yeah. yeah. You doing okay with COVID? You're using 18th century masks? Yeah, well, we, we're wearing masks and, and uh, we've always prided ourselves on letting people handle, not tools, but we have a, a we call a wear room filled with some examples of work over the years. And so kids can find secret compartments, people can play a harpsichord. Um, so we, we've had to stop doing that because any proper cleaning protocol would just damage uh, finishing wood too much. But um, yeah, we, we've we been lucky and, and Colonial was big as a whole, we were shut down for a couple of months early on. We've, but I've, I've been paid the whole time. We've, we've got a great group of donors that have really stepped up. We've also started doing more virtual things part of, I should mention this to this group. Uh, one thing that I do sometimes well and sometimes not is I, I, since the beginning of the pandemic, I've been producing what we call Trades Tuesdays, which are these live streams on, on Facebook. If you look at the Colonial Williamsburg Facebook page, you'll, you'll see all these videos there. Um, each week or every other week, we're in a different trade shop. Some weeks we have terrible failures of equipment and, and, and whatnot, but just this past Tuesday, we, we did a live stream with our blacksmiths. Uh, Ken Schwartz, master blacksmith, has been there for a long time. And it was, uh, he was, he made a paring chisel, an 18th century paring chisel. So um, he hammered that out and uh, then hammer welded the steel onto the iron for the cutting edge. Um, and if you look on, on YouTube or on Facebook or on the Colonial Williamsburg website, you can find that video. Um, it's pretty, pretty cool to see an expert blacksmith. Um, you know, turn a lump of iron into a, a nice paring chisel. I mean, he didn't he didn't make us watch filing and grinding, but still pretty, pretty cool thing. And that's ultimately the nicest thing about Colonial Williamsburg is all the other trades people go pick their brains or get them to make us something interesting. Yeah. Thank you very much, Bill. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you very much, Rusty. Uh, over to, I'm going to try and do this. There we go, Adam. Yeah, hi there. Um, well, thanks for talking uh, about Colonial Williamsburg. Um, I've been interested in it for a long time, actually, so it's nice to see you. Um, I'm just wondering uh, if you can do a quick walkthrough on making these um, double curvature pediments on high boys. Have you got time for that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, there's I mean, there's different ways to do it. You know, I did write a blog post for fine woodworking on on how i did that one um but basically it's it's all carved and there's no evidence on the original of, of that high chest that they ever things are uneven enough it doesn't look like they ever came in with any little planes to to finesse things i think he carved it and then maybe did a little bit of scraping um the you know sometimes you have this curved molding and it's you know, it's applied to a backboard and then the, the circle that the rosette goes on is a separate piece. On this one, that circle is integral with the molding. That made it really hard to carve because it, it creates this stop and I needed to come in from this direction. And on the original, it's very, very coarse in there. A lot of tool marks left behind and it's mostly lost in shadow. That, that piece is eight feet tall too. So it, it's not it's not really noticed until you're at eye level with it and looking from an angle. Um, but it was very clear from all that, that this was, this is all, all carved the way that I learned to do it. But I don't know if this is how anybody did it in the 18th century or not is uh, similar to how folks might, might 
plain molding. There's lots of different ways to, to plane a straight run of molding, but that idea of creating a series of rabbits, right? So I essentially did that every time there was a, a bigger transition, not every little transition. I just aggressively carved to define things with a V-tool, scooped out most of the waste with, um, with a gouge. And then what I, I used a router plane. So I, I set the offcuts from that molding next to the molding, used a router plane to come in and slowly define, you know, a fillet or, or whatever, you know, this was to set three different depths basically. And that gave me enough sort of information for my eye to be able to, before I could trust my eye to, to fill in the rest. And that, that's how Mac Headley taught me to do it. Um, and that's, that works really well, but it's one of those things, I don't know if, if they did it that way, you know, in the period or not. Um, mm. But I, I, if you look on, on the Fine Working website or, or Google my name or something, you might find, I do have a blog post that has some photographs of that of that process. I, d I did look at it actually okay, before okay. we started because um, I've been quite interested in it for a long time. Um, I, I went to um, one of the guild halls in London um, and they had an enormous broken pediment. Um, uh, and that was, that was a single curvature. Um, and it just looked too big to carve. So I'm just wondering whether um, you would have thought to make something that large, they would have um, specifically made their own planes for, for that particular job. I think so. I mean, probably. And I think some of, it, some of it might depend on how much of that work you're doing, whether you have those specialized planes or not, or, or bother make, you know, making those little finger or thumb yeah. right, whatever you call them. Um, and, you know, with, with this, with this particular piece, I was thinking, well, this might be an opportunity to, to explore those planes a little bit. But and then looking at the original, it was very clear that this was a guy more out in the country too, at that point, that that particular piece was made in, in Winchester, Virginia, which is was kind of the gateway to the to the frontier in the in the 1790s when that piece was made. Yeah. Uh, you haven't sort of come, I, I know you've got a bit of a tool collection going on there as well. Um, because this this pediment was it's two feet deep, you see, it's, it's enormous. Oh, okay. um, yeah. And um I, one of the things I was thinking, maybe they got some um some sort of stock uh round planes and would have put a radius on them. Do you think that, that would have um been one way of doing things that then they wouldn't have been kept because they were sort of a specific um, right for specific type of things so so over time we've got rid of this stuff yeah was... we have this we have this early 19th century tool chest with most of its tools still in it in the collection at colonial williamsburg it was an english maker who came over here two generations in the family with the chest and there are a number of these smaller planes that you know it's like are they coach maker planes or is this a you think the guy was a, a joiner doing high-end architectural trim work and so are those for doing curved sash and, and moldings and, and so forth. But they look like, I, I haven't looked at these in a while. I think those were all user-made planes. Yeah. Um, as opposed to all of his other planes were, you know, those are things he purchased. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking of making one actually. So um, that's why I thought I'd, I turned up today. I don't normally turn up because I'm quite busy, but uh, uh, yeah, I thought we might have some ideas how they did that, so. Thanks. So. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't, <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> Other than, yeah. Planning that much material sounds like a really good idea, but I think, I mean, that's ultimately sometimes for me, I mean, it's not satisfying as an answer right now, but that's the fun of the job is like, okay, I don't know. What if I yeah. try this? What yeah. if we try that? You know? Yeah. I think it's a matter of experimenting really, isn't it? So, yeah. yeah. Great. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'm going to add, there we go, Hank. Thank you very much, Adam. Thank you, Shrenik. Um, thanks, Bill. Uh, really appreciate you coming on. Sorry, I was forced to miss some of it. I'm actually at work, uh, sneaking a moment every now and again. But um, I wanted to give a shout out to you doing your Instagram stuff and your Facebook. I mean, avidly following. I've been to Williamsburg long before you were there, and it's such an enjoyable thing woodworkers talking to woodworkers who are doing traditional woodworking so i mean it, you're, you're emulating what bench talks about <laughs> so just a thank you oh yeah well thank you yeah it's i enjoy sharing all this stuff 
I, I used to be a, you know, in my graduate school days, I was on course to become a music theorist, which meant I would be talking about music to like five people who would understand exactly what I was saying. And there you go. So <laughs> it's nice to talk about something obscure to lots of people. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Your pie crust table was awesome. Just love oh, thanks. It. That was a fun, a fun project. <laughs> Take care. Cheers, Hank. Uh, I'm going to add Stephen when I can find him. Here he is. Stephen, you are our other historical reenactor. Re oh, yes. And I've been to Colonial Williamsburg a number of times, like many times um, when Roy Underhill was was one of the house was the house right. Uh, he, he took me around to a number of the shops. But the, la the last time my wife and I were there was 2013. And I'm trying to remember if it was the Hayes shop, but the mouse and the rat trap collection, is that in the Hayes shop or is that one of the other woodworking shops? Oh, our, uh, our, around that time, one of our joiners uh, took an interest in, in making some rat, uh, mouse traps. Yeah. yeah, so it was probably the joiner shop. Okay, because those were that was a real fascinating discussion on trying to find a way to build the better mousetrap. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah. Yeah. One of our joiners who since retired got I, I don't know what initiated that, but he he did a number of those and was kind of exploring. I think there were about fifteen or twenty of them when when we were there, and he pulled them down. They were stored in the upper shelf area, or the top of the one of the shelves, and. Anyway, that was that was a very enjoyable time. Yeah. And anyway, I just wanted to thank you for doing their work. The other place that I enjoyed was the gunsmith shop where they were doing uh, building from scratch. I mean, total scratch mm. um, flintlock rifles and all the woodworking and everything else. If anyone has never been there, that's a reason why to go to Virginia and um down in the swamplands area because you can also get uh, there are a number of federal parks in that area um and that's where we beat the british and <laughs> anyway i wasn't going to play that up too much today but oh uh, that's, that's okay because <laughs> i'm there are, there are a number of north americans sitting here tonight so anyway thank you again for your presentation you're, you're welcome thank you very much Stephen. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity. Well, actually, I'm going to let Phil ask this question first, and I'll, I'll, I'll wait. For, I'll wait till the end. There we go, Phil. Thanks, Ronnie. Um, it's it's almost it's not really a question. I'm stumped for a question. That's unusual. Um, I did want to say that furniture is my thing, so I really enjoyed that. Thank you very much for showing us what you did. It was just to say that you were questioning yourself about. I'm going to show them too many slides. If you ever have that voice in your head again saying, "I've got too many slides," just ignore it, please. <laughs> okay. Come back, come back with the rest, please. That's All right. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers, Phil. <laughs> uh, okay, we've got Mitch coming in now. <laughs> right, right when I get to the end. Just trying to confuse you, Shrenik. <laughs> uh, that was excellent talk. I really enjoyed that, and uh, and also the questions and answers. One thing that that um, I noticed was one of the drawers you made had the grain running front to back in it. And I wondered whether that was something you've got from historical reference. For the, the drawer bottom? Yeah. Yes, yeah. And that's, um, see that quite often. And that was actually some of the stuff, I was gonna do a whole thing about that. Um, but yeah, I, I will copy what's on, on the original generally, unless it's, you know, this is why this piece is cracked in half, you know, because they, they did this thing and then we'll, then we'll come up with a different 18th century piece. We're often a little more, we find it's easier to stick to the original with drawer bottoms because I remember I was in, I'd only been working here for a few months and a, an avid woodworker were talking to me and he was upset about <laughs> grain running front to back and you're not allowing for movement. I was like, oh, we're allowing for a little bit of movement. And, you know, I, and, and Mac Headley, uh, you know, just turned around and interjected at, at that point. And he said, well, it's a drawer bottom. If it breaks, unless you're storing, you know, if it cracks, unless you're storing sand in the drawer, it's probably okay. <laughs> and, if, and if it's not okay, it's a drawer bottom. We can fix it. You know, it, it's it's relatively hidden. Um, yeah, I've, I've seen that on, on a lot of pieces and done in different ways. 
whether it's in a groove or in a rabbit with the little glue block supporting it or whether on the one piece, it's just run all the way to the edges. Um, there's an article by Adam Bowett, I can't remember where it is, uh, that goes through sort of this history of the, the evolution of English drawer construction and you see these different bottom strategies. Yeah. His dates tend not to hold up once you get over into colonial America, you'll, you'll see lots of things happening, happening concurrently. Um, but the one of the first pieces I made was a table where the drawer bottom the grain is running parallel to the sides. There was wide drawer, there was three or four boards glued up to make the bottom. And they sat into a rabbit uh, on the sides and the front. And they're you know, little, little glue blocks glued to the bottom and then glued to the, the side of the rabbit to hold it in place. So the bottom itself isn't glued in, but these glue blocks are. Yep. And, and myself and another apprentice at the time were making these two tables, his was done first and it went over to a store in town where it was gonna be sold and they, they put it in their basement next to their furnace <laughs> and the drawer bottom shrank and, and it, pulled, it pulled the rabbits in. And so it cracked the, the, the drawer at the rabbit, you know, at the narrow part. And we got to looking again at the original and we noticed that the we didn't pay, we just thought things had come apart over time, but the three boards, I think that made up the drawer bottom on the original, we looked at it carefully and realized they were never glued together. They were just nailed in place. And that way, you know, if, if something opens up a little bit, each one is allowed to move individually. So on a, a wider drawer, that seems to be a solution that, that I've seen work on, on pieces. Um, but again, you're gonna, you're gonna get a little gap in the drawer bottom, but on a large drawer, that's generally not a, a big functional problem. Um, other things that we'll see on, on, often on small drawers, like very small desk interior drawers, you'll, you'll see that often enough, the grain running um, front to back and the whole bottom is, is completely glued into a, a rabbit on sides that are 3 16 or, or, or less. Um, and sometimes those things will pull away, but they're usually very careful to use quarter sawn material on those, on those sorts of bottoms. Um, but yeah, we, we, I think the... I always think the, the most boring part of a drawer to make is the bottom, but the most interesting to think about is, is are the bottoms because that's the way that, you know, whether it's a rabbit or a groove interacts with the dovetail and so forth, how are you allowing wood movement? That's yeah. all, <laughs> they, then they, there's so many different ways that people did it. Indeed, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Mitch. Uh, let, let's, let's give it a few seconds, just in case. <laughs> okay, I'm going to add myself here. Um, so, Bill, I've got so many questions for you. You said that you only had two saws, saws in your workshop that, that were yours. You only showed two. Rather. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. What other saws have you got? Okay, so we, each of us, are sort of our kit of tools in terms of saws is kind of like the assortment in the seat and chest, you know. Um, so I've got two larger you know panel saws and then I actually have two dovetail saws one with a thinner plate one with a thicker plate um and then what do I have uh, a tenon saw and a carcass saw and then we for years we've been sharing turning saws smaller ones and, and larger ones and that's a, a a project for earlier this year we're going to finish making making a bunch of those. So we all can only blame ourselves when we grab a dull saw. Um, I don't know why we've only had you know, one of those. A lot of the guys that I, I used to work with almost by default preferred, it, often when, when they could, instead of making a curved cut, they prefer making a series of straight cuts and then, and then blending things together. Um, we, I think our saw that most woodworkers are interested in the most often when they come in the shop is we, uh, you know, before they were cool, uh, we have a, made a, a reproduction of the Roubaix frame saw, four foot long frame saw. Um, and I think, I think sometime in the, in the eighties, garlic uh, made us the, the blades for that. And we still, we, we've only gone through one blade. Um, the, the pins that hold the blade uh, into the, the iron, whatever you call them, that, that hold the, the saw, those pins sort of wore away the, the steel over time as we as we 
tightened it. And oh, so wow. um, we looked at a recently studied a, a frame saw that Don Williams has, and it has a, an extra bit of metal folded over the edge, sort of like uh, the little um, adhesive reinforcement things for a loose leaf paper or something yeah. to just help, you know, protect the saw around those holes. So we're, we're thinking of maybe making a new one based on his uh, example and having our blacksmiths do that work. But, and then we also have some, some a handful of, of fret saws or, or Morris saws, you know, that um, beautiful, that were, were made um, in-house. Uh, we used to have a tool making shop for about 30 years and, and the shop's still there, but we don't have a full-time person doing that anymore. Um, but, and those were taken, I think, those are based on ones in, I think in Wix key. Nice. Um, okay, I'm gonna save the questions because uh, the talk's gone really long. Yeah. So, uh, well, this is about the time where we thank you uh, for delivering such a brilliant talk and answering so many questions. And we say cheers to you and cheers to the bench. Oh, cheers, Phil. Cheers, Phil. Cheers, Phil. Cheers, Phil. Cheers, Phil. Cheers, Phil. To the bench. Thank you very much, Bill. You're welcome. It was a pleasure.